Bonjour à tous et à so, hello everyone. Today we have the Vice Prime Minister of Quebec, Geneviève Guilbeault, who will talk to us about the situation of the coronavirus in Quebec. She's together with the National Director of Public Health of Quebec, Dr. Horatio Urbuda, as well as the Minister of Health and Social Services, Ms. Danielle McCann. Thank you very much. So, hello everyone. As you know, today our Premier is having a well-deserved day off. So we all hope that he will be following the guidelines of Dr. Arruda if he decides to take advantage of the spring, and we do wish for him to uh, be able to take some time off. He's all he's doing excellent work, as we all agree. So we are experiencing a difficult situation, as you know, for now slightly over two weeks, but it's important to keep the morale high, and it's important to remember that we're all in this together, to remain united in solidarity and to not stop following the guidelines of public health in order to slow the spread of the virus. Today's numbers shows us to what extent it is important now more than ever to respect those directives. Since today we're at 2,498 confirmed cases, an increase of 477. We have 43 thousand cases that are negative and 6,700 cases under investigation. 174 people are being hospitalized. That is an increase of 23. 57 of them are in intensive care, which is an increase of seven people. Unfortunately, we have four new deaths with a total now at 22. And of course, I want to take advantage of this moment to offer in the name of all of our governments, our condolences to the family and the people who were close to those people. I know that it's difficult to hear this every day, and today is no exception. But we have to interpret the situation as being one more reason, if there was one more needed, to scrupulously follow the guidelines and directives of public health, since each gesture counts and everybody has to have their share of the burden so that we can get to the end of this virus. So today we are setting up new measures to keep reinforcing the compliance with the guidelines of public health. I will start by getting back to the situation in Montreal. As you know, yesterday was announced that the city of Montreal, the Montreal region, is placing itself in a state of sanitary emergency following an advice from the public health authorities. I want to reassure everybody, despite the announcement of the state of emergency yesterday, I want to reassure the population and all of those listening to us. The situation is under control. The fact of placing Montreal under a state of emergency simply allows us to act more quickly to avoid the worst. It avoids, amongst other things, to have police patrols in certain of the most affected neighborhoods. And we, of course, continue working closely with community organizations at a local level who help our vulnerable people, amongst them our homeless population. The situation is more difficult in Montreal and in the eastern townships, as you know. But no region in Quebec is safe from a situation that could worsen from one day to the next. Therefore, today we are announcing a guideline from public health which will allow us to control the way people move around in certain regions of Quebec. The objective is to better protect people who live in those areas which are considered to be more vulnerable. So the territories affected are the Bas Saint Laurent, Abitibi Témiscamingue, Côte Nord, the northern area of Quebec, Nunavik, and the Cree lands around the Bay James area. The objective I would like to remind you of this new order is to control people moving around and to better protect populations who live in those places who are considered to be more vulnerable because they are often more isolated. There are the el elderly people, there are First Nations who live in those areas, and so the public health authorities feel that in order to control the people leaving those areas as well as trying to get in, it allows us to better protect the people who live there. So as of 4 p.m. today, there will be police control points that will be installed on the roads and who will allow the control of the coming and going in these eight sectors that I have just mentioned to you. 
So don't be surprised if, as of 4 p.m., you are intercepted. And if you do not meet the criteria of essential circulation, you will have to go back to your place of origin. So only essential traveling will be accepted in, in these eight sectors that I just read out to you. As you know, we're doing all of that to protect our most vulnerable regions. The guidelines has been repeated abundantly by the Premier, and I repeat it today. Independently of these eight regions that we're adding today, where people moving are going to be controlled, everybody should stay where they are right now and avoid moving around from one region to the next unless they have an absolutely essential region to do so, reason to do so. Another guideline which is critical is that of mandatory isolation of travelers who are entering the country, people who are arriving from the United States or anywhere, anywhere else. The 14-day mandatory isolation. The federal public health has clarified its guideline about the mandatory isolation, and now it really is total confinement for 14 days of all those who came from outside, who must stay home. No reason for leaving their home, not even to take a walk, going to the grocery stores, not at all. They must stay 14 days unless they have to go out for a screening test. That is the only reason that may allow you to leave within the 14 days when you come back from traveling. So, of course, we're asking all Quebecers to comply with this mandatory 14-day self-isolation when you come back from traveling and to make sure that people are respecting these guidelines. Since 9 o'clock this morning, we have been installing control points with police officers along the U.S. border. So we have police officers who are also meeting people who are arriving. It was already done in the airports, but now we want to do so at land borders with the United States. So the objective is, of course, to remind those guidelines of mandatory isolation to make sure that everybody is conscious of how they have to do this, having a contact with those people, giving them information, having information on those people to be able to do follow-ups. And of course, the objective is the same. It is to protect the population and prevent contagion. I would like to say a word on the role of police officers. Of course, I invite the citizens to remain vigilant and to mention situations that are obviously going against collective safety of our citizens. For example, a gathering in a park, which of course should not take place. We can understand that that will be a, make people call. But of course, remain prudent don't fall into what we could call abusive surveillance with a climate of suspicion between neighbors and co-citizens. We cannot become paranoid either. So if you say that your neighbor has one car more than usual in front of their homes, it's not necessary to call the police. So please, you know, weigh things out in your way of mentioning situations or not. But of course, in a case of doubt, I privilege vigilance. But, you know, we don't want to create any fights between neighbors. It is not time to feed frictions with our neighbors. On the contrary, if there's one thing we have to keep in mind right now is that we have to remain united in solidarity. We have to all go towards the same objective, which is fighting against the virus and making sure that we are setting up all the winning conditions to get there by respecting, of course, all the guidelines of public health. I would like to end by the traditional thanks of the day. You will allow me today, as Minister for Public Safety, to thank all those who ensure our daily safety, people who are very important, our police officers, our firefighters, all of our civil safety teams, my teams at at public safety, but all over the place as well. Emergency measures teams, they are very active and are essential to the mission that we are accomplishing all together collectively in Quebec. So thank you for all the staff from the Correctional Services of Quebec. That network is also at the front line with a clientele that is different, but very important in the context. All our private security agents, which are more and more numerous to be sent out all over the place, 
so that they can also ensure the collective compliance to respect those guidelines. So I want you to know that you are precious to us in these circumstances. Most of you are used to danger in your work, but right now we're all facing a new kind of danger. This is unusual because it's invisible and it can be everywhere. So I thank you. Know that your work is appreciated and that we will do everything that we can to protect you from this virus and to ensure that you have the safest and reassuring working conditions. Upon these words, I will end with the usual message of solidarity. We're all together in the same fight. We all have to together respect the guidelines to be able to get out of this. We all have a share. We all have to contribute to this collective effort. We have to remain unified as we have been until now. And I wish to thank all Quebecers to be so respectful uh, and to obey this these guidelines. And it is in this way, united with solidarity, that we'll get through this fight. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy Premier. Now the question period. Ms. Deputy Premier, Dr. Ruda, hello. Madam Minister, my question has to do with the restrictions. We're talking about certain regions that are along New Brunswick and Ontario. Will there also be an interprovincial restriction? And if it's not the case, what is the use of these restrictions? For the time being, control points are really with the U.S. border, as I was I was saying. You see up to date, we have them in saint bernard de la Colle, saint Armand, and in Stansted. Of course, uh, the situation, as we say it often, regardless of the question that we are asked, uh, we have the same answer. That is that the situation is evolving every hour of every day. So we could adapt, but for the time being, our objective really is a U.S. border. We know that there's a lot of preoccupation on the part of population. Uh, about the snowbirds, you know, the people coming back from the United States, more specifically from Florida. And we realize that perhaps there are people who are not necessarily familiar with the specific guidelines that apply to them. So that preventive, mandatory isolation of 14 days, we wish to do the utmost to make sure that every single person checking, going through the border right now will know. There are already employees of the federal at the federal level doing so, but we want to maximize our prevention measures to be able to make sure that everybody is aware of these guidelines and that nobody will have reason to not apply them. In the context, are there measures that have been taken to protect police officers or uh, reserves, for example, because they're going to interact a lot more with the public? Yes, since the beginning, we at the Ministry of Public Safety, we have a structure of communication and a permanent liaison with all of our police forces in Quebec, whether it be the SQ or the municipal, as well as the indigenous police forces. So we make sure that the information circulates. And of course, we also make sure, and I said it, Earlier on, we to protect our people, to be able to allow them to exert their work in the safest possible conditions. So the guidelines, of course, they respect the guidelines as much as possible according to the kind of intervention that they have to render. But of course, we make sure to protect them. They're at the front, as I said it. We need that. They're part of our society as well. So of course, there will probably be people already people who have to be put in isolation and perhaps some could be contaminated. But uh, the police forces have con contingency plans. There's even the SPVM that has put themselves in a state of emergency, which uh, is organizational, Sherbrooke as well. So everybody's adapting themselves to the situation. But at a Public Safety, we keep the leadership to transmit guidelines, uh, to apply them, etc., according to how the situation evolves, but especially for the safety guidelines for our people. My question was addressed to Madame McCann and Dr. Arruda. Uh, Taking into account that you are deciding to close down eight regions as of 4 p.m., do you fear that there will be an explosion of cases that might make it that the health network in those regions might not be able to deal with it? 
In fact, it has to be said that when we close down regions like this, if there are essential services that are necessary to be able to help out, we let them go through. That is the first thing. The second thing that I was want to say is that the network has been preparing for at least three weeks, and we've already said it, we have freed up 7,000 beds in the network. There are beds that have been freed up in those regions as well. Our emergency wards elsewhere are not very busy, and so much the better, because we've eliminated certain elective activities in all regions of Quebec. So for those regions, as for all of Quebec, we have prepared ourselves. And what I mean as well, I want to take advantage to say uh, something that is very important for the population. Yes, we have COVID-19 and we have to deal with the situation. But for all other health problems that requires an intervention, an emergency intervention, we're there. If you have pains in your chest and you think that you're having a cardiac arrest or a heart attack, call the ambulance. If you have any symptoms of cardiovascular disease, you call the ambulance. So I want to launch that message very strongly that, yes, we have a lot. We have put the focus on COVID-19 and it's normal. But as I've said it, problems that require interventions now in the short term that are urgent and pressing, we are there for the population. We continue being there. So you call the ambulance and we'll do what is necessary. I've heard that some people are worried they're scared to go to the emergency ward or to go to the hospital because they're scared of catching COVID-19. Those people should know that we have the protective measures in place for uh, and for problems of health that are others than COVID-19 that requires an intervention. Don't hesitate. Go to the emergency ward. Call the ambulance. We'll take care of you. If it's not urgent but that you need having some kind of intervention, you can also call your doctor if you have one in the medical clinics. The doctors are really already at the phone with their teams right now. You can call a clinic in your neighborhood. You will be answered. So we're there as well for all other health problems. Um, to what uh, Madam Minister was saying, she's quite right about the fact that the capacity of care has also been increased in other regions. But independently of the capacity of care, we have to consider that these are communities that can be more isolated. For example, in the northern areas in Nunavik, we've already had tuberculosis epidemics. People live in areas that favor transmission, so we protect those people. We also know that it's in those regions very often the population is older than the Quebec average, so they're at more risk of encountering complications. So independently, I would say, of the approach of healthcare capacity, we're applying the strategy that was done. You know, if you look in China, the Yuan region was very affected and the other provinces a lot less. So we want to apply those same elements. So that's independent of the capacity. The public health directors analyze, make analysis and recommend things to us. And I also want to tell the population that these kinds of measures are prescribed. They bring about anxiety, but don't panic. You have to apply what you, what we ask you to do, but also find ways of, you know, of relaxing yourself. Listen to music. Listen to things that, that you like. We are not in a situation of a loss of control. Because you are participating with us, you, the population, yes, we have cases, but things are being well managed, and we'll see within a few days, a few weeks, what we'll have succeeded to do. I also want to get back on the desk. I also wish to offer my sympathies. You know, we look at statistics, but these are human lives, and all human lives are important. But also, to tell you what we had said at the beginning, we had told you that the vulnerable people were especially the elderly. But I just want to mention to you, for example, that most of the cases are around the period of 80 to 89. We have two that are 90 and over, and there's nobody under the age of 60. So what we can see is as of 70, the risk increases. 
The more data we get, and, uh, and I mean, I don't want us to get more data to give you stable statistics, but we just want to let you know that although coronavirus is fatal for those people, and that's why we have very important measures to protect our elderly, most people who will fall ill are going to get cured, a very good proportion. I'm not even going to need to go to the hospital, and some people, they're just going to think they even have a cold. Except that, even if we're not at risk, we have to protect others. That is why we have been install, installing these guidelines. That is why we've been intervening. So when the Premier said, you know, don't move around if you don't have to, it is in order to not spread cases that will become bombs for those vulnerable people. We must, in our actions, do this, and that's what we're doing right now. And that is also how we will be following the situation from one day to the next, and each of the measures will be uh, adjusted according to the epidemiological uh, situation. Dr. Arruda, right now I didn't hear the number. How many cases, confirmed cases, are we at? 2,498. 2,498, and that is your test. If we go with the level of uh, propagation, according to your estimates, how many people in the Quebec population might be a carrier, a vector of the virus, but that have not yet been tested? I don't want to, you know. But if we are talking about the fact that one person contaminates eight, oh, hold on. One contaminates eight in a situation where measures of social distancing and confinement have not been applied. That's one thing. But to be able to answer you, we'd, we'd need to have data, for example, in a few weeks to see the curve and all that and calculate what we call the R0, that is the number of cases that each case generates. One to eight is that we don't do anything. I can tell you that's not what we've been observing in Quebec because we would already be in a much more ascending curve. But if you'll allow me, being a scientist, I cannot talk about something for which I don't have a valid scenario. What I can tell you is that right now we're not at one case that generates eight because we'd already be a lot more cases and that we'd have a lot more people in hospitals and a lot more deaths. For the benefit of everyone, Ms. Guilbeault, could you rename the regions because it's not clear what you said. You talked about eight regions, but you named five, I think. Maybe you might have forgotten some. Is it possible to get uh, the specific list? I said uh, eight, but perhaps it's six. The Bas saint laurent Abitibi-Témiscamingue, Côte-Nord, Northern Quebec, Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean, Gaspésie-Île-de-la-Madeleine, Nunavik, and the Cree lands around the Bay James. You're right, perhaps I had skipped over two. But I'd like to also bring another uh, to detail. I don't know if it was clear for everyone in complementarity with Mr. Laforest's question. Those regions were going to control the displacements, you know, people going in and out. There's going to be checkpoints. Everything will be forbidden except what is considered to be essential. And what we mean by essential is everything having to do with essential services, as uh, is in the list that we published a few days ago. Everything having to do with health, everything having to do with humanitarian help. For example, if there were to be floods and the Red Cross would have to go, well, that obviously we're going to let them go. Everything that has to do with essential services, health and humanitarian situations will be considered as essential moves and will be authorized. But isn't there a dissonance with what you said earlier on? Because the Gaspésie area has a border, uh, you know, with New Brunswick, and bas saint does as well. There's other ter territories that have a border with Ontario. You're not going to control those sectors, if I've understood correctly? There's not going to be checkpoints at the border between New Brunswick and Quebec, for example? For the time being, we're concentrating on the U.S. border. I said it earlier on, since 9 o'clock this morning, we have police checkpoints, and it is an issue and a major preoccupation. I'm sure that you felt it like I have in the past few days. The influx of people from the United States has caused a lot of concerns, and we want to make sure that every person coming into Quebec in the country, but Quebec more specifically, is aware that it is mandatory that they self-isolate for 14 days and to not go out for under any reason except for the case of screening tests. In New Brunswick, they themselves took the decision to close what we can call the border between Quebec and New Brunswick. Uh, except for, you know, certain kinds of workers and merchandise. So the decision was already uh, taken on their end. As far as Ontario is concerned, we're not 
thinking about preventing people moving for the time being. I keep saying for the time being because, as you know, things change from one day to the uh, one day to the next. If two weeks ago we had said we were announcing what we're announcing today, people would have thought that we were crazy. And yet things are evolving, and we evolve with them. The objective is always to prevent to the utmost. We want to increase our preventive striking force. So by installing checkpoints at the U.S. border and limiting non-essential move uh, traveling in Quebec, which is a huge territory with those eight sectors that I just mentioned to you, and adding with all the rules of public health that we already know, the mandatory, strictly mandatory 14 days when you arrive from from uh, the outside, all of that together will help us to slow down the propagation of the virus. We learned yesterday that the city of Laval requisitioned a hotel along Highway 15 to transform it into a hospital to send 133 patients from La Cité de la Santé. Are there any other projects such as those in Quebec right now? Are there any other regions that are preparing to do the same? As I mentioned, we have 7,000 beds that we freed up, but also 1,500 beds outside of the hospital centers throughout Quebec that we could get. On top of that, there are 4,000 spots in hotels, and perhaps it's even increased, but at least 4,000 spots in hotels that we could go get as well. So Montreal, for example, we have L'Hôtel Dieu that we are preparing. There's Grace Dark that we are also preparing, and the Notre Dame Hospital. There's a certain ward that was uh, inoccupied and that we will use. So hotels, yes, certainly at least 4,000 spots. So you'll probably see in the upcoming days other regions that are going to be announcing that they are going to be working with certain hotels close to their own facilities. Um, in France, there was a very uh, particular phenomena. Parisians have tried to uh, leave the city to be in uh, places that are quieter and apparently that uh, helped the spread of the virus. So yesterday, the premier said that he wasn't against the fact that certain Montrealers might go to their cottage uh, elsewhere in Quebec. What are you going to do so that this phenomenon does not get reproduced? What happened in France? Well, to start with one point, we discourage people from moving interregionally. And these superfluous. Yes, yesterday we were saying if you want to go to your cottage, you can go. But as much as possible, stay in your region if it's not essential. If you absolutely have to go to your college, well, stay in your cottage. Do not move around after. And at any rate, with the new announcement today, the extra order that has to do, uh, that touches these eight regions in question, many people who have cottages or who were thinking of going there anyway won't be able to go there anymore. So people uh, should know as of 4 p.m. you cannot circulate in those places for reasons other than essential reasons. But as much as possible, we ask people to limit their displacements, whether it's for leisure or, you know, avoid going from one region to another, particularly if you are in Montreal or in the Estrie region. So let's avoid superfluous displacements. Also, I wish to tell you that the guidelines is very specific today, but already the Premier was telling us that we had to avoid interregional displacements, and I think that he also added the fact that if people went, because, you know, we are, uh, of course, limiting people's freedom, so we have to have the correct dosage. What he was saying is that people who went, for example, uh, leaving Montreal to go to the Laurentians, well, to not start shopping all over the place, because that, uh, it, it was rather to go to a cottage and to bring your own food ahead of time and to really self-isolate or to get somebody else to shop for your food by neighbor in the area. So he was already announcing that kind of principle. Now we are operationalizing it because with our data, you know, we have some sectors that are more hotspots, so it's now more adequate to have stronger measures depending on the epidemiological situation. And as the Premier said, and I've been saying it as well, you know, what we said yesterday is one thing, what we'll be saying tomorrow will be different as well, because we are adapting. We're not contradicting ourselves. We are revalidating. You know, it's like yesterday, he didn't say that at 4 p.m. there would be checkpoints. 
check whether people could move. And with that perspective and experience of what we can see elsewhere, it's that people leave from that area and they don't know that they're infected. They think in good faith that they're just going to go somewhere and then they become the source that bombards a place. According to the information that we have from health professionals, there are maneuvers that are no longer being practiced on patients that have the coronavirus because of the risk of propagation, for example, cardiac massage. What is it really? Patients who are infected, are there maneuvers that are no longer being made? No. We continue treating the entire population, including people who are affected by COVID-19. No. That is misinformation, I would tell you, false information. What I want to tell the population is that if you have a health problem that is urgent, such as the one that you are describing, we will do the maneuvers. Our people are equipped. They have protective equipment and paramedics as well. So no, we are continuing. So that information is totally Merci. Not exact. Exact. A precision, Mr. Arruda or Ms. Gilbo. Why not install checkpoints on the roads all around Montreal or the hotspots within Montreal or around the eastern townships, the places that you have identified as being hotspots? Well, Dr. Arruda could certainly complete, but already in Montreal, with the request of public health to declare the state of sanitary emergency, it makes it that there are already accrued means and extra checkpoints or checks that can be made. For example, police uh, in certain areas that are more problematic. So there are already extra measures that have been taken in Montreal. And there is, of course, the message that we've been repeating, avoid moving from one region to the other. And the Prime Minister did, uh, the Premier did say it yesterday, avoid leaving the region where you are, either going in or out. But Dr. Ruda will be able to complete. But just to finish, sorry, uh, the regions that we're announcing today where we are controlling people moving around, it's because they are considered to be more vulnerable for various reasons. And so we are doing this as prevention to protect the people living there and Dr. Ruda can complete. Well, that's quite what it is, uh, Madam Deputy Premier. What we're doing in the east, the eastern regions and the northern regions is prevention, to avoid that there be a transposition of the concentration of hotspots towards those regions. And together with that, there will be decisions that will be made locally by public health directors based on an order that I have given. That is to say that right now in Montreal, the city of Montreal, together with the director of public health, the police officers, the partners are going to be having more intense uh, activities around the hotspot. It's possible that it will also take place around the eastern townships, whether it be the cities of Granby or Sherbrooke. All of this will continue to be done. So what we're doing now is that we are preventing that this contagion go towards the east or the north, and we control where it already is. So this is an analysis that is um, done every day according to people's behavior and according to the application of guidelines. But they're being reinforced in these places. Maybe uh, an extra detail, Madam Deputy Premier. Up until now in Montreal, what has been said, and I understand that there are extended powers, but uh, what's been said until now only concerns uh, the homeless. And now you're saying, well, yes, there will be police checkpoints in certain areas. But none of this was said publicly up until now, specifically. What I mean by that is, what are the measures being taken in Montreal? What are they? Why are they being taken and where? What we have been told is that there are more police patrols in certain more problematic areas. But of course, it is the city that makes those decisions in collaboration with the city of Montreal. Uh, police force, the SPVM. And I believe that Madame Plante, the mayor, is also going to announce extra measures eventually. But uh, we have made sure to give the city of Montreal all the necessary means to be able to act quickly. And that is the reason why Dr. Ruda asked that we grant the state of emergency to Montreal, which was done yesterday. And maybe he wishes to complete. 
Yes, it has to be understood that there was an issue with uh, the homeless population. To be able to localize them, uh, there's uh, a plan of action that was worked on between the Ministry of Health and the City of Montreal. Also, to be able to have access to certain places, requisition certain places. So the mayor of Montreal, she needed that state of emergency and we gave it to her. But by giving it to her, you must understand that we've already emitted for the public health directors orders to intervene with groups that might present certain problems. An example, an individual whom we know to be infected and who voluntarily contaminates other people. On the basis on the law of public health, we can emit an individual order. And we could also, you know, the director of public health, that's why, that why there's a decentralization of those powers, because they are the ones that have the information in the field. They are the ones that work with their partners to do so. Of course, where there are hotspots, there might be more people moving around, circulating to see what the state of affairs is. And there might be, and I'm not telling you what it is, because it's Montreal that is going to be informing us of what their action plan is. They are the ones taking the decisions. But if they identify certain problems, they will have the power through that order that was given by me to confine people, to even possibly give fines if people don't respect things. With an approach, you know, we warn them. If we already gave them the information, if they don't apply it, we intervene with a little bit more constraint. And if ever there are issues where it even requires fines, it could be done. So it's all powers that are given, but, you know, they are better adapted to make those decisions. So yesterday was Montreal, but it's possible, you know, we're discussing about certain issues elsewhere and somebody is going to be giving me uh, information and also in complementarity with the city, with the police forces, with community organizations, with the key actors in an area, all the stakeholders, those decisions will be taken jointly you know, ordered by the by the director if necessary so that the application of all done is done with cohesion and harmony. And all of that, as I was saying, is done for questions of public health. And I wish to reiterate it. It's not a power trip. It's not to say here we are limiting people's freedoms. But when we see the impact that it has, we're lucky in Quebec. I think that thanks to all of you, we are going to experience scenarios that aren't going to be so catastrophic as others. But we must take these measures at some point, because otherwise, we are going to see a more important impact that will take longer. So it's better to have an intense striking force right now rather than having to pay the price for it in a few weeks. I calculated quickly, but I think that for the past four or five days, we've seen increases, new cases of around 25%. I'll just finish my question. Yesterday, British Columbia took a, uh, showed a lot of numbers, very detailed charts between projections and results. Yesterday's projections, they said there's going to be an increase of 24% per day. And now they've been telling us for the past uh, few days, we are at 12% increase, and that is what makes your British Columbian counterpart, we are flattening out the curve. In Quebec, with the measures that were taken between the 12th and the 16th of March. In Quebec, at the same time, we're also uh, setting measures, and you said that it would take 10 to 12 days to see the effect of those measures, but we're still in increases around 24 percent per day. Are we flattening out the curve, or can we not do so? If you'll allow me, first of all, I want to be very, let's be very careful with comparisons because the timings, you know, uh, British Columbia had a lot more known cases and perhaps didn't have this, the same kinds of entries. People came from China, whereas we, uh, you know, have people coming from Europe. That's uh, all those factors. So between what we projected and what we're experiencing, we're right on top of it. I just want to give you an element. It is normal that at the beginning, and it also depends what we're talking about, but at the, be at the beginning, we can see increases and the flattening of the curve will happen after. We already have effects. And I'll also be careful. In our cases, we have more cases. I don't know the testing strategy in British Columbia. But what reassures me is that, yes, it's true that we have a lot more cases. And it's true that we have deaths, unfortunately. Too many, in my opinion. But we're not in a curve where we have the impression that we... I mean, there is community transmission, but I would tell you that the dynamic in Quebec is different. We had the spring break, which created certain elements. 
We had the borders that were not closed to Italy and France, so these people don't necessarily go to British Columbia, so maybe we had more outside bombardment. I know it's a strong word, but this is what I believe. And I believe that it's still too early, even if it would be pleasant, you know, to have um, comparisons, but they're not valid, scientifically speaking. But I can tell you we're keeping a very close eye on it. Together with everybody else, we'll have better characteristics. But a, a series of indicators tells me, and I ask my questions to the experts every morning, are we where we thought we would be? And the answer is yes. I talk to epidemiological experts from the Institute and elsewhere. So the comparisons, the increase of 25% compared to this, and we have more, I would like to know what the testing strategy is that they have. And now you can tell me that they test more than we do, but now we're testing more than British Columbia. It's clear, less in Alberta, but they're much smaller populations. There's a lot more um, things to be considered if we want to have a scientific answer. We can't just go with rates or proportions. Bonjour à vous. Uh, avez donc ciblé, uh, so you have targeted eight regions where we could see increases, general increases every day, but did you notice a more marked increase in those areas that you have uh, decided? No, not necessarily. If you'll allow me, the main factor, as I said, is they've had uh, increases, they're in, they can control their situation very often, it's people who came back from traveling, they don't have community transmission indexes like we have in Montreal or Granby. It really is for preventive purposes. Basically, I'll make a comparison that has nothing to do in terms of numbers, but it's as if Montreal and perhaps a part of the eastern townships was the hotspot like there was in China, and what we're doing is we're closing that down. We decrease. We don't have a total barrier. We're not preventing essential services from moving around, but we are putting a filter to make sure that the importation towards the regions is slowed down. And also in those regions, there are more old, the older people, more risky people, more diabetes, etc. And so you gave the reasons why it would be allowed to circulate, for example, essential services, health, etc. But there will be a lot of uh, cases for which police officers are going to tell citizens that they have to turn around, if I understand. But there are young adults that have parents, for example, in other regions that uh, want to go grocery shop for them because they can't go out anymore. Are these the kinds of cases where police officers are going to have to decide whether to allow it or not? Well, regardless of the situation in which police officers or any other uh, police force has to intervene, there's, you know, you have to use common sense. There's always exceptional cases, there's always an analysis that has to be done. But we ask people to avoid moving around in those regions unless they really are in essential services. So the agri-food chain, medical services, etc., humanitarian help possibly. If the parents in question, the example that you are giving, can have a friend or another member of the city that lives in the same region can do the groceries for them, because of course, you know, we are giving the message to help out our parents and grandparents. We have to, we want them to remain at home, but they do have to eat. But if other people can help them in the same region, we absolutely have to prioritize those solutions to avoid inter-regional displacements. This is our preventive striking force. I keep saying that, but that's the idea, the preventive strike force at a provincial scale, and that measure is part of it, as many others that we have announced gradually in the past two weeks. And we've been going gradually in the past two weeks. Today we are at limiting the movings around in those eight sectors. We don't know what uh, is coming up for what's coming up now, but people must understand that we have to apply strict public health measures to limit contagion. It is the only way to be able to get through this. English questions? Bonjour à vous. Um, Madame Guilbeault, we're seeing these checkpoints going up in uh, certain regions that you're saying are more vulnerable, and we're seeing sort of an increase in the involvement of police, security, limiting travel between regions. Is there a plan in place to step things up even further, and what might that look like if you need to restrict movements in these hotspots, like in Montreal, in the eastern townships, is there a plan in place? Are you still taking it day by day? What could the next step look like as we start to see more police checkpoints and more surveillance? 
we have to take it day by day and hour by hour because the situation evolves every day, like as you know. And uh, if uh, if we do those, if we put in place those measures today, we might have to put more in the next few days. But we cannot answer that today. We have to look at the situation uh, every day and make the right decisions regarding the situation, uh, the day being. But the important thing for us is to be more uh, offensive, as offensive as possible in a prevention way. That's why we put those uh, checkpoints by police at the border with America and uh, in the, um, to control all going and moving from and in those eight regions. And if you may uh, add, even if we uh, are looking at it day by day, that's, that's the case and that's what is needed because things can change and we cannot say if it's going to be Istria or which region is going to be there. It's not an improvisation. I just want to make you sure that we are going step by step, but we don't know exactly when the next step is going to be. It's why we have to need an evaluation. But don't think we wake up in the morning and say today it's going to be that uh, and I've not thinking, I would say, days and weeks before. Uh, we've got plans, but at the same time, there is so much scenarios that we have to adjust the plans to the reality of the day. And we always are thinking what is going to be the next step. So it's not improvisation, but it's, it's a re-evaluation with all the information. Because I want to make sure that don't people think that we decided in the morning, we decided somebody did it, and we did that. We know exactly what are going to be the steps, and we must adjust to the reality. Yesterday, uh, Montreal declared a public health emergency. Uh, we saw some measures, as you mentioned in French, uh, to put up tents for the homeless. Have the thoughts changed on uh, how to isolate the city, how to protect everyone as the number of cases continue to go up? And is there more plans to restrict people's movements in these sort of hot spots? I think that's why we uh, are, are there in Montreal to take into control the situation, because they are the ones who know what is going on in their hot spots. What are the problems? What are the different communities who, who, who are not observing or, or not? How to intensify? And, it, and they will decide if they have to do control, get in, get out of the hot spots. Uh, what are going to be the conditions? Because we cannot also close everybody from the, from the world. But if needed, if there is, uh, what they would, it will depend on what is going to happen in the other parts of Montreal, you know, because there is also cases on those places. Even if there is hot spots in, in some regions, there is cases elsewhere. So all that is going to be taken into account. They will decide it based on their epidemiology, based on what the public health director says that there, but they will attach that with us. If there's going to be an, a big step, just I can imagine uh, we are not there, that they want to control everybody from Montreal to get out or get in. That will be discussed with us, but they are the ones who can make the diagnosis, who get the data, who get the partners, because we don't decide it without having the partnership that we have needed with communities, with, with the mayors, with, with, with the or, uh, organisme communautaire, I would say the ones who know the, the specifics uh, uh, and the leaders in the community. I've received a few questions of colleagues who are working from home. So one question from CTV News. What does the city, Montreal, now have with this local state of emergency? Can they detain people, arrest people? Can they block off certain areas of the city? Yes, they have this power. Uh, their ordinance is good for five days. It's re-evaluated. They are out the power if it's done under, I would say, a public health uh, authority. If there is a, a risk for the others by the comportment of one person, they can act and even can put somebody in isolation and, 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 and do that, yes. Raquel Fletcher, the Global News, you are restricting access to eight regions. Why not ban interregional travel in general? Why not ban travel to and from Montreal? In fact, our prime minister, I'm sorry, can I, may I? Our prime minister already said that it's not a good idea at all to go from one region to another one. Actually, we are, we are banning, we are not banning, we are making control to make sure that the 
only people who travel is for essential services, humanitarian and emergencies and health is issues. That's, that's done especially to protect those communities with older people and, and uh, higher risk, and we don't want them to go. And there is also some, uh, I would say, uh, restrictions that are going to be made by, by the mayors and the public health of those regions with hotspots that will try to minimize the risk of getting in and getting out. Question de Philippe Oti de The Gazette. Can you tell us more about the recent deaths? Can you tell us what regions they were in? Can you give us an age range? Yes. Uh, I want to say my condolences to the families of those 22 deaths. Uh, as we knew, as we pro pro projected, they are older people. They are from, I would say, different regions. There is uh, in Gaspésie, La Madeleine, uh, Uh, there is in chaudière appalaches Estria, Montreal, Laval, La Nodière, uh, uh, Laurentide, and Monterigi. All the cases are over 60 years old. Most of them are on the 80, 89 category. There is two 90 years more and three on 779. So in, in fact, uh, it's older people over 70. Most of them have Uh, medical conditions, or cancers, or, 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 or everything, and uh, hopefully we don't have any youth person actually. But this could always happen. It's not uh, tell, but most of the cases are, as we told, older people who have chronic disease. Okay. One last question from Philippe Autier: At what point will you consider screening all people entering Quebec, especially from other provinces? Screening everybody in Quebec? Entering Quebec, yeah. Okay, in, in fact, what, what we do is that people entering Quebec, I would say from United States, where, where, where there is, I would say, a risk higher than, than inside, they must be in quarantine for 14 days obligatory. They don't want, have to go outside, even not take a walk. It's, it's under the federal law. And uh, they will stay home. As soon as they have symptoms, they will get away for get being tested. Now, for people from other provinces and perhaps the ones entering in a zone, if it's not a service essential, they could be at home for 14 days. And if needed, if they get symptoms, they will be tested. Because don't remember, you must remember, if you have no symptoms, you cannot test people because the test will be negative and doesn't mean that you are not sick if you have no symptoms. Merci, Madame la Vice-Première Ministre. Je vous laisse le mot de la fin. Je sais pas si vous vouliez... I don't know, Madame Premier, if you wanted to say a few words in English from what you said in French. Do you want to come back to certain points? Yes, yes, we have time. Perfect. So, as you know, the Prime Minister is taking a well-deserved break today. We are in a difficult situation. But it's important to keep your spirits up. We are all in this together. It's important to encourage each other to stay united and to keep going. Today, we are announcing a public health order to control movement to our more remote and vulnerable regions. Starting at 4 p.m. today, we are only going to allow essential travel to these areas. There will be police checkpoints on major routes to return people who do not meet this criteria. This morning, we also started setting up police checkpoints along the American border. It will allow us to inform citizens returning from their trips on the directives they need to follow. People coming back from a trip must stay home for 14 days. To win this battle, we must retain, remain united. Everyone must contribute in their own way to the collective effort. This is how Quebec will get through all together. Merci à tous. Bonne fin de journée.